Hello, welcome to my channel, Small Optics. My name is Jason. Now, at the time of recording this video, we're in the month of June. So that means if you were to walk outside on a nice clear night, face east, look up, you're gonna notice quite a large triangle in the sky. Now, what you're more than likely looking at is what's known as the Summer Triangle. Now, this uh, formation of stars isn't actually a constellation. It's just a grouping of stars uh, in, the, in, in the night sky. And uh, the name, uh, the Summer Triangle, is completely unofficial, okay? It was actually coined by um, a British astronomer, the uh, late, great Sir Patrick Moore who uh, had a show, or oh, still is uh, running the show, The Sky at Night. Um, like I say, it's, it's still running, but he presented it for many, many, many years. And sometime in the 60s, he uh, just referred to this uh, group of stars as the Summer Triangle. And it's kind of just caught on. <laughs> and now, no matter where you live in the world, people know what you're talking about when you're talking about the Summer Triangle. Now, just in case you're not familiar um, uh, with this uh, particular group of stars, uh, let's have a quick look at it, okay? So, like I say, go outside, face east. Now, just look up, basically, and you're going to see. Now, if you're familiar with three constellations, you're going to have no problem finding it, okay? The first constellation is Lyra, okay? The uh, lyre, or, which is like a little harp. Um, we've got uh, the other constellation is Cygnus, the swan, okay, and the last constellation is Aquila, the eagle, okay. Now, the dominant stars in uh, these three constellations, we've got Vega in Lyra, we've got Altair in Aquila, and we've got um, Deneb in Cygnus. And now these three bright main stars form the Summer Triangle. Um, it's called the Summer Triangle basically because it's, it's mainly available in the summer months. Now there's some interesting uh, objects in and around the triangle, uh, but I just want you to concentrate uh, somewhere in the middle down towards the bottom of the triangle, if you like. Um, and you're gonna need Pretty dark skies to see this. You can see this in light polluted skies, don't get me wrong, okay? But there's two constellations in the middle of the triangle, and obviously darker skies are gonna allow you to see it a lot better. Uh, the first one, and they're, they're both interesting for very different reasons, actually. Uh, the first one is um, this really complicated uh, constellation. I mean, you're gonna get your head around this one. Uh, it consists of these amount of stars here. Yeah, that <laughs> that's it. Okay, this is um, this is uh, Vulpecula, okay, um, known as the constellation Vulpecula. Now, believe it or not, that represents or supposed to represent a fox. Now, where to get a fox from? Two stars? I, I really don't know. I could just imagine them. Um, you know, two 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 blokes sat down, like you know, uh, have we got uh, have we got a dolphin? Yeah, we've got a dolphin. Have we got a bear? Yeah, we've got a bear. Uh, what about a fox? No, <laughs> no, we haven't got a fox. Oh, well, that'll do. <laughs> I mean, where, where, where did you get a fox from? Two stars. But anyway, that is the fox. Now, just below this amazingly uh, detailed picture of a fox, Vulpecula, um, there's a constellation, one of my favorites actually, uh, Sagittar. Now, Sagittar is one of the few constellations that do actually resemble a little bit what they're supposed to be. Now, Sagittar, if I put it up there, you can see it kind of looks like an arrow, and that's exactly what it represents. Now, it's a shame that Sagita isn't, or Sagita, however you want to pronounce it, isn't a little bit more this way up, all right? It'll always appear to be pointing that way because it would actually point directly to the main target of today's video, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Now, Sagita almost points to M uh, M27. It's just a shame that it, like I say, it isn't tilted a just a little bit further up. But if we go to the last two stars of uh, Sagittarius, okay, and 
Well, it's between these two stars, actually. It's like the middle and the second from the end stars. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm going to take those two stars, okay? Now, the best way to do this is to hold your hands out under the night sky at arm's length, okay? And use your finger and thumb exactly like I'm doing here, okay? And you want to get it and measure those two stars. Close one eye, okay, sight, and do like a pinch grip to close until you get them two stars, okay? Now, all you've got to do is twist your wrist like this, like on a pivot. So imagine that you're pivoting on your thumb. Now, that distance you've just traveled and that angle, okay, every, unless you're double jointed, you'll come to a, a point in your wrist where it feels uncomfortable to try and go anymore. Do you know what I mean? There's just a natural point there and a natural point that way. So if you go from those two stars, do this little twist. Now close your eyes and keep, not close your eyes, no, don't do that. Keep one eye closed and just note where the tip of your little, uh, of your forefinger is on the night sky, if you get what I mean. There is the Dumbbell Nebula. Now, it, whenever you're looking for deep sky objects and using this form of star hopping, it's always a good idea to have your telescope pointed roughly where you think it's going to be, okay? So for something such as the uh, the dumbbell that which we're finding today, find Sagitta, okay, or Sagitta, okay, the arrow. Find that, find the end star, okay, in your, in your telescope, using your finder scope. Make sure you've got a well calibrated finder scope, especially when you're hunting for new uh, targets, um, you know, especially when the deep sky. So you really want a well, well calibrated finder. So get the constellation Sagitta or Sagitta, uh, the arrow in your field of view, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, and just trace it back in the eyepiece just to make sure you've got the right constellation, okay, and you're pretty much certain that you're there. Now do your little um, finger measuring technique that I told you about, pivoting it over, okay. Now because your telescope's pointing pretty much where it needs to be, do this pivoting technique, okay, while you crouch down at the finder scope, okay, you see what I'm saying. Now, as you now you're going to keep one eye closed. It's the same sort of technique you would do for binoculars, okay. You don't take your eye off that point. Like we've we've measured that when we went round like that. Remember, we got a point in the sky, an imaginary point. We've got one eye closed, and we're going to keep gazing at that point. Okay, and we're going to go to our telescope now. Keep gazing at that point. Do not look at your telescope. Okay, and bring the, uh, the red dot or the crosshair up to that point that you are looking at. Okay, and I can guarantee you doing it this way, you're going to find targets so much easier. It's going to take out a lot of this fishing about, all right? Now you may still have to do a little tiny bit of fishing about. If you do, you still can't find it, okay? Go back to the technique I told you. Make sure that you, you, you are, if you look at the, um, the diagram I'm showing you, if the arrow was actually straight, uh, the, the dumbbell nebula would be at right angles, directly above it, the distance of those two stars that I was talking about, okay? So we're virtually just turning it that way a little bit, all right? So you're gonna have to go at right angles, but up towards the uh, left a little bit, as uh, if you get what I mean. So, just be patient with it. It's not a difficult target to find this, okay? So, like I say, if you don't find it first time, I'm not saying you're gonna hit it absolutely spot on every time. Just move your telescope around in little tiny, tiny movements, okay? Whenever you're doing, uh, I keep referring to it as fishing, and you know what I mean by that, when, you, when you're doing this, where is it, where is it? Think of how, how a farmer plows his field. Okay, a farmer doesn't plow his field all willy-nilly all over the field because he misses bits, basically. Well, when you're sweeping the skies, kind of do that in the, the same technique. So you're going to go, I like to go uh, the field of view, whatever the field of view is, say that's the circle there. I'll go up to the, to the top of the field of view, you see, like that. And then I, I know how much distance I've got and I'll do it in little squares like that using uh, the field of view as as the like how far I should be going up across down 
All right, so do it in an organized pattern when you're sweeping for deep sky, deep sky targets and you're gonna find that finding those elusive little fuzzies is gonna be that little bit easier. Now, whenever you're hunting, especially for deep sky targets, always use your lowest powered eyepiece, okay? Now, um, always remember, it's a big misconception about uh, telescopes being all about power. You can't have the power without the aperture, okay? So, like, such as the Dumbbell Nebula, for instance, this is a 130 millimeter telescope. I struggle to see it in a 10 millimeter eyepiece. Okay, just simply, the telescope just cannot produce, I can see it, don't get me wrong, you know what I mean, it is there, but don't expect it to be a big, bright um, object like you see in a lot of photographs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it is going to be quite faint, um, it is quite small. Uh, like I say, depending on the size of your telescope, the more power you can put on. But as a rule, your lowest powered eyepiece is going to give you the best views. Now, once you find the Dumbbell Nebula, um, just appreciate, because it will be a little bit faint, but just appreciate that that thing you are looking at, that little fuzzy blob that you're looking at in the eyepiece, is 1,360 light years away. And you're seeing it in your little, whatever size, so a 70 millimeter fractal like this, this, that'll show it, okay, something three, you know, 1,360 light years away. It's quite incredible, really. Um, so what actually is the Dumbbell Nebula? Oh, by the way, it's also known as the Apple Core, which I think it is better suited, really. I mean, it looks more like an Apple Core than it does a Dumbbell to me, anyway. Um, but what actually causes this? Well, same as the ring nebula, um, this is uh, what's called a planetary nebula. Now, it has absolutely nothing to do with planets, uh, okay, so it's a kind of a misleading name. Basically, it's a star that's dying, okay, and it's all the, and when a star dies, it just expels these gases and all, all this stuff that just radiate into the atmosphere, well, not the atmosphere, but the outer space, if you like, causing these big plumes of gases that we see. Now, like I've already mentioned, this is uh, one particular target where you shouldn't have much trouble at all uh, seeing it, even in small telescopes, okay? It's quite a bright nebula. Well, I'm saying it's quite a bright nebula, Realistically, there's no such thing as a bright nebula. They're all uh, quite faint in the eyepiece. Um, but this is one that you can actually see with binoculars. So even if you've got a pair, a pair of binoculars kicking around, have a go at looking through them. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, especially at this location, cannot find it. And I know where I'm looking uh, for in binoculars. Um, I'm using a pair of 12 by 50 binoculars. And for some reason, I can't see it. Now, I do have quite uh, a lot of light pollution and I'm virtually looking through uh, the uh, sodium glow of a street light. Uh, my, my eastern sky is terrible, really. So maybe you'll be, more, uh, I'll be a lot more successful than, uh, than I am where I am at this location. But you are gonna need pretty dark skies, okay, to see it with binoculars. Uh, but give it a go. And if you do see it with binoculars, let me know. Let me know. It'd be interesting to see if you uh, have found it. Uh, and Because uh, I always read the comments. Um, it's always great to hear uh, how you're getting on and uh, uh, finding these deep sky objects. Well, that about wraps it up for another video. Thank you so much for watching if you've watched this far. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed already because I do do regular uploads. And don't forget to hit that notifications bell. I've been checking on my uh, YouTube studio and there's quite a few of you that haven't hit the notifications bell. So make sure that's turned on because you never know that next video could be just the one you've been looking for. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Take good care of yourselves and I will see you on the next one. Bye for now.